We're very fortunate uh, to again have as our keynote speaker, Hugh Johnson. Hugh serves as chairman of Hugh Johnson Advisors and manages $1.2 billion in equity, fixed income, and cash investments for individuals and institutional clients, and serves as a consultant to $1.2 billion in institutional assets. Hugh is a graduate of Dartmouth College. He served as an officer in the United States Navy. Uh, he has a master's degree from Southern Methodist University. He has served as the executive vice president and a member of the New York Stock Exchange. His work appears in New York Times, Business Week, USA Today, also WGY Radio, and CBS News. He's been awarded several honorary degrees. He enjoys his home in Vermont, plays golf, continues to dream of playing in the National Hockey League, but he's also the grandfather to two grandchildren whom I'm sure he will tell us about. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see such a great turnout. And it's great to, it's really great to be uh, invited back to uh, speak to you again. Um, a real thrill. In fact, you're the only group that's ever asked me back to. <laughs> <laughs> you should remember what I, what I, I told you last year is I, I asked you what the, uh, what is uh, diapers and economists have in common? And the answer is uh, you, you need to change both of them every now and then, and both for the same reason. <laughs> I, have, um, I have one public service announcement which I want to uh, sh share with you. Um, a friend of mine uh, uh, has two tickets to the 2019 Super Bowl, uh, box seats, uh, airfare, uh, accommodations, uh, but he, uh, he didn't realize uh, until a couple of days ago, he didn't realize when he bought them, got them, that this is the same day as his wedding. So he can't go. Um, so if you're interested and want to go instead of him, uh, it's at St. Peter's Church in New York City at 5 p.m. <laughs> her name is Louise. I actually, I, I should share with you a, a, a real story, a, a true story, and since we have such eminent politicians that are with us today, I'll try to say this and say this and be very brief. But I grew up as a Republican, John, you'll be happy to know, I grew up in a family which are staunch Republicans. Uh, but my closest friend was Vic Grazer, who was from Buffalo, New York, who was a Democrat and became the chairman of the Finance Committee and with Paul Kirk, I don't know if you remember him, but uh, with Paul Kirk, Democratic Party, and of course he was my best friend, so he asked me to, he asked me to be a member of the Democratic Party or become a member of the, become involved in Democratic politics and to join the executive committee of the Democratic National Finance Committee. And uh, he said, and I said, that doesn't sound very appealing to me. That sounds like you want me to give money. And then he said, um, no, no, we go away. We have great uh, boondoggles. We have par parties. We have a really great time. And he said, this, that, and then you and I will get a chance to spend a lot of time together and drink a lot of beer. And so I reminded myself of what Mark Twain said uh, I have been to Carson City, Nevada. Uh, there is nothing but uh, gambling, uh, liquor, and prostitution. Uh, I've always been a good Presbyterian, uh, and I did not long remain one. Uh, so <laughs> I did not long remain a good Republican from uh, Buffalo, New York. But the truth is I did not become a Democrat. I became an independent to try to preserve some of my independence, which really is very important to me. Um, this is, uh, and I hope I can, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot that we have to cover. Um, and uh, the, the, let, me, let, me, let me just start out, there's a lot of questions, a lot of questions I have, a lot of questions that I'm sure that you have. Um, uh, questions about really where are we in, in, the, in the current cycle. In the post-war period, there have been uh, 10 uh, cycles. Uh, we are currently on the 11th cycle. Uh, those uh, cycles consist of three parts. They consist of a stock market uh, cycle, followed by an economic cycle, uh, followed by an interest rate uh, cycle. The uh, average uh, duration of the 10 prior uh, stock market cycles is 57 months. The average magnitude of the 10 
prior stock market cycles uh, was 126 percent. The average uh, length or duration of the uh, 10 prior recessions that have accompanied the uh, stock market cycles uh, was 60 months. Uh, we are currently at the 110th month of the current cycle. Uh, the stock market has gone up 311.4%. Uh, so it's only natural that you ask the question, are we at or near the end of the current uh, cycle? Or in the immortal words of Gerald Ford, the American presidency's answer, Yogi Berra, has the pendulum come full circle? Um, <laughs> Yogi Berra said, uh, if you get to the fork in the road, take it. And the question, the question is, uh, have we reached that fork in the road, the end of the current cycle, where the uh, principal investment strategy, your principal investment strategy needs to shift from capital appreciation to the preservation of capital or your business strategy, or for that matter, uh, your, 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 your strategy as a policymaker needs to shift from, say, offense uh, to, to defense. This is an important question. I spent most of my life boringly trying to answer questions of this magnitude, important questions of this sort. Uh, I've developed a methodology which I believe in, I develop all, the only methodology I think that can be useful in answering questions, and we'll try to do that right now. Um, the, the, the methodology really consists of uh, three steps. Uh, the first, uh, first step, though, which is not uh, up there on the screen, is, um, <clears throat> is to uh, identify, well, I'll start with the, uh, is to go and get, look in the mirror. I think I told you this last year. You, you have to go look in the mirror in the morning and you got to say, I don't have a clue where the markets are going. I don't have a clue where the economy is going. And then you get down to the serious work and the serious work really involves the step, second step, of course, of identifying the important trends that are unfolding in the, on the financial markets, not just the direction of the stock market, but a lot of detail. And then secondly, uh, or now thirdly, uh, the trends in important monetary and economic variables to try to determine if indeed the trends you're seeing unfold in the financial markets are rational. Are they consistent with what's going on with important monetary and economic variables? And then the final step is if you're an investor is to try to uh, position your portfolio, uh, position your portfolio to participate in the trends that are, if they're rational, the trends that are unfolding uh, in, in the financial markets. And then the last step, which I didn't tell, that yeah, isn't up there, is you go to church and you pray that those trends are going to continue. But the whole purpose, the whole purpose of this is that the financial markets on the one hand and the monetary and economic variables on the other hand perform in very specific ways at the beginning, the middle, and the end of a, of a cycle. And so if you can identify where you are in the current cycle, then making those important questions, uh, answering those, uh, uh, making those important decisions, answering those important questions like, What's the percentage of assets that you want to uh, allocate to equities? Uh, or an important business decision, you want to continue to expand your business or do you maybe want to contract, hold the line, draw in? Um, th those, those become a lot e easier to answer. Th these are really important questions. And I know that after we've experienced what we've experienced in the first quarter, some of you may remember from late January, January 29th to February 29th, the stock market went down 12.2%. Then from February 9th to February 27th, it went up 10.4%. And during that period of time, during that decline, we had two days in one week where the stock market declined 1,000 points in two days in one week, which is the first time that's ever happened. So this kind of thing makes you concerned about, look, where are we in the cycle and how much more of this can I take? That's enough. I, I only cried twice during that whole period. Um, <laughs> It's, it is obviously an important, important uh, issue. When you've done this, you're really not done, as I've mentioned to you in the past. Uh, you're pretty much done if you can do that and do that well uh, to identify where you are in the current cycle, but you're probably not done because there may be something going on in this world of ours that will affect the underlying cycle. There may be a uh, mania, a mania which consists of, as I've mentioned to you perhaps uh, last year, uh, uh, four important steps, the stage of investment where you, you, you're an investor and you buy a house to live in it, the stage of speculation characterized by the uh, emotion of euphoria, where you borrow money to buy uh, a second, third, and a fourth home in Florida or Nevada. Uh, you buy a second, third, and a fourth home uh, at a price which is arguably too high, overvalued, 
uh, with the hope, the dream, the fantasy that it's going to go even, even, uh, even higher. Um, as John Kenneth Galbraith once said, and I think he put it quite right, the circumstances that induce recurrent lapses into financial dementia have not changed in any truly operative fashion since the tulip mania of 1636-1637. Uh, it's, it's during this stage of speculation that a lot of, a lot of money is made. As Kindleberger told us, what happens is you see friends get rich and there's nothing so debilitating to your own feeling of self-worth self is to see a good friend get rich, which leads to a, a, a sort of a monkey see, monkey see, monkey do environment uh, where everybody uh, jumps on board. And that's not a bad idea at the beginning and the middle stages of a mania. Uh, so again, Kindleberger, the author of Manias, Panics, and Crashes, the best book that's ever been written on the financial markets, wonderful, wonderful person, um, uh, as, as, as he once said, um, not only getting rich really makes you feel a little bit, uh, seeing your friends get rich, but uh, when the rest of the world has, has gone mad, uh, maybe it's wise to imitate them in some small measure. Um, it, here's, here's a mania that's going on now, uh, and that's Bitcoin. And we could talk about that later, but we've got so much other material. If I, I can give you my view on it. But the one thing you should recognize, that if you want to know what a mania looks like, that's what a mania looks like and take a look at those uh, numbers. And the question is, is if that mania comes apart, and it looks like it is coming apart, to what extent is that going to affect uh, the stock market or the underlying uh, cycle? Because to some extent, it, it, it will certainly uh, affect uh, the underlying cycle. Okay, let's, let's go quickly through what I think are the current trends in the financial markets. And I'm gonna to try to bring you up to, as much up to date as I possibly can, and these can be a little bit misleading, but if you take a look back at a turning point last August, or even if you go back to the beginning of, um, uh, beginning of uh, this year, or if you go back to the election, you can see that generally speaking, there's lots of peaks and valleys that the trend in the stock market has been up. Uh, it's also the case, even this year, uh, even though the stock market is down, that even though the stock market is down, investors generally have been migrating to the so-called economically sensitive uh, sectors of the market, which really means uh, that they're somewhat, or at least somewhat uh, modestly, um, optimistic about prospects for the economy. If they're not pro optimistic about prospects for the economy, they buy the defensive sectors. Defensive sectors, things that are safe, things that post good earnings regardless of what's happening to the economy, utilities, telecommunications, consumer staples, things like household products, uh, includes toothpaste, you know, all your friends uh, brush their teeth uh, even though the economy is failing. Uh, all, most of my friends brush their teeth even though the <laughs> economy is, is failing. But consumer staples, telecommunications, utilities, and to some extent healthcare, and they buy the stocks which are more economically sensitive, so suggesting that they're more optimistic or becoming more opt increasingly more optimistic about prospects for the economy. And you see that uh, consumer discretionary and technology stocks, even though the market's down a little bit this year, are still at the top of the ladder. Uh, again, investors uh, have migrated towards, continue to migrate towards small and mid-sized companies, uh, which are more volatile and more economically sensitive than large so-called safe stocks, such as uh, larger uh, the S&P 500. Uh, in addition, remember what I told you, the stock market and economy and interest rates. It's not just the case that the trend in the stock market is up, but the trend in interest rates is quite clearly up. Um, in addition to that, uh, the spreads, spreads between lower quality uh, uh, debt market instruments uh, the, as measured by the, the spread between the yield on a BAA corporate bond and a 10-year treasury. Uh, the, the, those uh, spreads have, have narrowed. Uh, suggesting that investors that buy BAA corporate bonds are willing to accept a lower yield or a yield that's closer to a 10-year treasury. And again, that implies that those investors are becoming somewhat more increasingly optimistic about prospects for the economy, or the economy will be good enough so that we will not see defaults among those that are uh, BAA rated corporate bonds. Same thing true of junk bonds. Uh, junk bonds, the spread between junk bonds and 10-year treasuries uh, has closed uh, somewhat, again, suggesting investors becoming more, somewhat more, continuously becoming peaks and valleys, more optimistic about prospects for the economy. Here's something I want to, it's a little bit technical, so this is a uh, junkies alert, uh, and, and, and it's something that I have found really useful and very interesting. This is done based on work done by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. 
And what it does is it tells you today uh, what the probability of a recession starting 12 months from today is. And it tells you that based on the spread or the difference between uh, the yield on a 10-year Treasury and the yield on a 91-day T-bill. Sorry for the technicality, but nevertheless, that spread will tell you what the probability is of a recession starting uh, in 12 months from today or in March of 2019. And as you can see, um, although the uh, probability is increasing, uh, it's increased rec actually since 1%, it was down to 1%, up to about 10.8%. It's getting higher. It's still not at a level that would say that it is alarmingly high or that the prospects for a recession are pretty strong or high uh, between now and uh, March of 2019. Compare that with the numbers that we saw at the beginning of 2008. At the beginning of 2008, now remember what I'm just about to say. The, the numbers we saw at the beginning of 2008 were based on the numbers that we saw or looked at at the beginning of 2007, well before that recession started. The numbers at the beginning of 2007 said the chances of a recession starting in the January of 2008 got up as high as 40%. You can see the difference between what we were looking at then and what we're looking at now, which is it's true that the prospects of the probability of a recession have gotten a little bit higher, but they still remain very low and particularly low if you compare them to the last time we saw real problems in the U.S. economy, which of course was 2008-2009. So the message of the financial markets collectively, the stock market is going up, investors are migrating to the so-called economically sensitive sectors of the market. Uh, small cap and mid cap stocks outperforming large cap stock spreads, quality spreads in the bond markets are narrowing. The message of the financial markets, including the yield curve, is that the, um, <clears throat> the, the economy not only is expanding, but will continue to expand through 2018 and uh, early 2019. And the question is, is that, uh, is that consistent with a rational forecast for the economy, uh, for the economy, for monetary, do the monetary and economic variables agree? I'm going to go through this really quickly, but because um, this can get pretty tiring. I've seen a lot of people's heads go right into their soup when I've still gotten through this. Um, but Federal Reserve policy, despite the fact the Federal Reserve is obviously leaning towards restraint, and we, always, we all know that they're leaning towards restraint and are likely to lean even further towards restraint, which is another way of saying, are going to raise interest rates further. Uh, interest rates are still, comparatively speaking, uh, fairly low. The real federal funds rate, which is really the way to measure Federal Reserve policy, remains uh, negative at minus 1.8 percent. And then something, again, more technical, the level of excess reserves, so the amount of reserves in the banking system are there to support an increased amount of lending and therefore increased liquidity or money growth. Uh, the level of reserves in the financial system are, and I'm just staggered by even saying this, high, but really high. And that's, of course, because of what happened during the financial crisis. They're trying to reduce that level of reserves, and they're doing so in a very orderly way. But believe me, those numbers are fairly high. So Federal Reserve policy, despite the fact it's leaning towards restraint in a very measured and a very intelligent way, is indeed um, still fairly accommodating. Uh, despite the fact that they're leaning towards restraint, we're still seeing, we're starting to see, or continuing to see, a slowdown in bank lending. This is a little bit of a puzzlement. Because we're seeing a slowdown in bank lending, we're seeing a slowdown in the growth of the money supply. And here comes the most troubling uh, chart, is because we're seeing a slowdown in the growth of the money supply, liquidity conditions for this country of ours are getting a little bit dangerous, which simply means, I ask the question, I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, say, do you know where things are going? No. Do you, do, do you, what about liquidity conditions? What do you think of liquidity conditions? And the answer to the question, is there enough liquidity or money to drive both the economy and the markets? And the answer is yes, barely. Um, so we got to watch that one uh, pretty carefully. Uh, tr traditionally, historically, this has been a really important indicator. And then finally, the index of leading economic indicators, indicators that tell you where the economy is going, not where the economy has been. The index of leading economic indicators uh, has continued to rise for 22 consecutive months and still is sending the signal that the economy will expand through 2018, 2019. So the message of the financial markets is positive. The message of the financial markets, investors are saying that the economy is going to continue to expand through 2018 and 2019, or the first part of 2019. And that's consistent with uh, important uh, variables, uh, monetary and economic variables, particularly the index of leading economic indicators, which is also saying that the economy will continue to expand. 
Okay, let's, I'm going to quickly try to quantify all this to give you actual numbers uh, that will show you um, what, what I think is going to happen or transpire through 2018 and 2019. I show in, mochi, in each one of these uh, charts, I show uh, the consensus forecast, and then on my right is my forecast. Now, uh, I, what I would do if I were you is I show not only the quarter-by-quarter quarter numbers going through 2018 and 2019, but I also show you the uh, annual numbers, 2017, 2018, 2019. That way you can get an idea. The, the, the annual numbers, since I, I got so much information on these charts, you might pay attention to the consensus on the annual numbers as we're going through these charts. Those, those will give you an idea of kind of what I think is going on. My numbers are going to be, gen with the exception of interest rates, generally in agreement with what you see from the consensus. As you can see, uh, these numbers, 2.3, a little bit of a jump to 2.8% in 2018, tax cuts, and in 2019, back to 2.5% uh, growth in the economy. These are pretty anemic numbers. Uh, the average uh, annual uh, growth of the economy, gross domestic product, which measures output, uh, the average uh, uh, since this, this recovery began is 2.2%. The, the average for the 103 quarters prior to this, uh, in, during the recoveries of 1980 to 2009, uh, was 3.7%. So you're going to ask the question, why is it the case that the U.S. economy is so anemic or is showing such uh, poor growth? And the answer to that question would seem to be that, first of all, the growth rate of the, the population has slowed. Uh, secondly, the participation rate or the percentage, percentage of individuals, particularly women, that are, that are actually either in the workplace or are looking for a job has come down. Lots of folks are dropping out of out of the uh, labor force. And then finally, because the participation rate has come down, the growth rate of the labor force is now uh, very anemic. Not only is the growth rate of the labor force anemic, but the productivity of that labor force has also grown at a much less rate or at a slower rate. So, not, so, so GDP, uh, gross domestic product, which really effectively measures output of our labor force. You have the labor force has slowed down, you have the productivity of that labor force has slowed down. And as a result of that, you get GDP numbers. Again, our scoreboard for the economy, a measure of output, has come down. It is not showing the kinds of uh, robustness that we saw from 1980 to 2009. Now, I want to, I want to, I want to, uh, there's more to this story. And this is what I really want to say. Th this, this shows you the, the, the top 10 companies in 1990 uh, by market capitalization and the top 10 companies uh, in 2017, uh, in 2017, uh, the top 10 companies by market capitalization. It also shows the revenues coming from those companies, and it also shows the number of people that they employ. And what you will see is that the revenues, uh, the number that they employ has gone up about 35 percent, 37 percent, and the revenues have gone up approximately 300 percent, which says something really simple that this economy of ours is becoming far less labor intensive. And it's becoming far less labor intensive because people just can't find jobs. And why can't they find jobs? The reason they can't find jobs is because it's become less labor intensive because of the exponential progress in technology. 50% of the cost of a semiconductor is, is knowledge, research, development, and testing. 70% of the cost of a pharmaceutical drug is, is knowledge, research, development, and testing. The economy is becoming far less labor intensive. Uh, the, the interesting thing is a lot of folks think that that's going to change or that's not going to continue. And I'm not going to get technical, but some of you are familiar with Moore's Law. And many people will say Moore's Law is dead. That's wrong. Yes, it may be dead. Moore's Law may be dead. But that doesn't mean we're not making additional progress through what's called specialized computing. It'll be, it'll be the case that technology is going to continue to expand and that the whole process of becoming less labor intensive is also going to expand. And the question is, what are we as a country 
what are you, John, going to do about this? Uh, because this is a real, a real challenge. There'll be more and more people that uh, can't lose their jobs. All people who've dropped out of the labor force because of demographics, you know, the baby boomers are going to become too old. Biggest reason, though, is clearly people can't find jobs, and they can't find jobs because the economy, because of the progress in technology, is becoming less um, labor intensive. Uh, there, there are, there are going to be ways to solve it, but here's the real challenge. The ways to solve it is probably going to be increased spending on infrastructure, number one, and number two, the military. Uh, and if you, 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 that's fine, but the problem is, is that given the deficits and where they are and where they're going, um, that really is going to mean, I hate to say it, it's either going to mean higher taxes or you're going to have to do something about entitlement spending because there just isn't the room. And, and, and that's what the challenge is going to be. Yes, infrastructure, yes, military, but what's going to give? Higher taxes? I don't think there's a big appetite for that. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, that's one point. Uh, let me move on. This, this is just a comment made by Martin Feldstein who says, uh, given the productivity numbers, we're probably not measuring this stuff uh, right. I'll go on. Uh, employment. Uh, that's the, that, that's the, that's the, that, yeah, it actually was worth, but we got out of time. Um, the <laughs> employment, okay. Uh, that's the, sec that's the, um, the secular problem. There's also the cyclical problem that we're facing, which is um, the unemployment rate, as you know, has come down because we've, we've added a lot of jobs. And uh, there's a lot of tightness showing up in the labor markets. So we're going to continue to add jobs through 2018 and 2019. But if you take a look at the numbers on the left, or even my numbers, you can see that the average uh, gain, monthly gain, uh, uh, in addition to jobs to payrolls is going to come down, or it's going to be a lot less as we work through 2018 and 2019, largely in response to, again, that tightness in the labor market. The same thing is true. The unemployment rate's going to come down, but it's not going to come down in the leaps and bounds that we saw in 2014, 15, 16, and to some extent 2017. It's going to continue to come down, but it's going to be pretty stuck uh, around current levels. Uh, in response uh, to that, uh, to the tightness in the labor markets and the slow growth in jobs, you're going to likely see consumer spending also. Again, look at the consensus forecast, 17, 18, and 19. 2.6, 2.4, 2.3. These don't sound like big job, uh, big numbers, but they really are big numbers in an economy, which is a $16 trillion economy. So consumer spending is going to slow through this period as well. Uh, because of the tightness in the labor markets, we're about to see some, not a lot, of upward pressure on wages. And again, not significantly high upward pressure on wages. That's largely because uh, although there's tightness in the labor force, a big reason for tightness in the labor force is a decline in the, un is a decline in the labor force, uh, but it's because there's so many workers that have become very discouraged. They're out there and they're possibly coming back into the labor force. We saw that a couple of months ago. So that means that um, even though uh, you might think there'd be more upward pressure on wages at this point, with this tightness in the labor markets, uh, there's probably not going to be all that much. Some, but not much. In addition to that, um, consumer inflation, uh, the Federal Reserve's been hit, uh, targeting 2%. We're, we're at the 2% level, and we're likely to go a little bit above 2%, but you're not going to see much inflation. The capacity utilization rate, or the percentage of the economy that's being used, that's in use, it's still very low. There's lots of room on the upside. I don't think you're going to see much upward pressure on wages. In response to all of this, in response to these conditions, um, you're likely to see the Federal, you're not likely, you're going to see the Federal Reserve uh, raise short-term interest rates. Who knows how much? The expectation now is that the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates once this year. They'll do it also again in June, and at least one, maybe two more times in 2018, and three times in 2019 and 2020. It's anybody's guess. But the Federal Reserve will be leaning towards restraint, and you can see uh, that's, those are the federal funds rate, the target for the federal funds rate. You see the consensus is pretty close to mine. Uh, as a result of that, other short-term interest rates are going to be rising. Uh, and again, uh, here's where I differ. Uh, the, federal, the consensus uh, expects uh, interest rates to be rising more than, than I expect. Uh, Longer-term interest rates, again, the yield on a 10-year uh, treasury is currently uh, pretty close to 3%, 2.96%. The expectation is uh, as the Federal Reserve leans towards restraint and raises interest rates through 2018-19, Short-term interest rates will be rising. Long-term interest rates will be rising. 
Okay, here's the chart which I gotta tell you there's sort of good news and bad news. Um, in response, remember what I told you, the cycle. Stock market, business, interest rate cycle. And what this is consistent with, these are, this is, I've crunched these numbers and I didn't try to make these numbers come out the way they came out, but they did come out this way. And this shows you through 2020, or two, third quarter 2020, um, the operate, with the biggest, the strongest part of this economy, what's really driving this stock market right now is, is earnings. Earnings are extraordinarily strong. Why? First, the tax cut. And secondly, of course, just what I was mentioning before, the economy is becoming less labor intensive. These guys are coining it. Um, believe me, earnings are very strong, and that's the good news. The bad news is, uh, is that, of course, interest rates are going to be rising. So interest rates are going to be rising, will serve as a drag on the stock market, but the rise in interest rates will more than offset the growth in earnings, which is likely to be strong. Until you get to late 19, uh, 2019 and early 2020. Look at the bottom, and you'll see that things don't look quite so rosy. Um, what that says is that we're going to get to that point in time where the, the, the bad news of rising interest rates will not be offset by the good news of strong earnings. The bad news interest rates will reach a level where they'll more than offset the good news of uh, rising uh, of strong earnings. And then that's when you may see the end of the current cycle. Uh, it, it's quite likely, based on the numbers that I'm looking at, uh, and I'll just say quite lately, let's say um, a strong possibility uh, that by uh, mid-2019, uh, early part of 2020, uh, that interest rates will reach a level which will, I don't want to use the word kill off, but, but make it very problematic for the economy, for the stock market, and then the economy uh, to continue on expanding. You'll notice uh, these are the numbers. Um, these are the numbers, you, you really can't tell, but what these numbers um, tell you, uh, the uh, returns between current levels of interest rates and returns between, between uh, current levels of the stock market, and they look pretty good. But you'll notice the difference between fourth quarter 2019 and third quarter 2020 for the stock market, about the same. See that? Fourth quarter of, two, see it's about the same? That tells you that you're going nowhere in 2020. And then again, that's very consistent with what I'm talking about. Okay, let's get quickly New York State. New York State is gonna, any questions yet? I mean, I'm going through this stuff pretty rapidly, so I hope, I hope I'm not losing you, too bad. Um, <laughs> at any rate, uh, New York State, uh, it's, as much as we try hard, as much as our policymakers try as hard as they can, believe it or not, New York State tends to really track the national economy. And it's, it's going to be either a little bit better or a little bit worse than the national economy. Uh, the somewhat good news, I suppose you would, is here's going to be the outcome uh, for, um, as measured by employment, uh, not only for the U.S., but for the uh, other states uh, in uh, the Northeast or in New England. And you can see uh, New York State uh, comes out number thir three behind uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts with other states doing a uh, little bit less well, shall we say, uh, towards the bottom. Uh, then we have metropolitan statistical areas and the same numbers. I want to show you, I want to emphasize a couple of things. In, in all cases, the metropolitan statistical areas uh, uh, are going to do better in 2018 and 2017 for the, all the same reasons that the national economy is going to do a little bit better. Um, not the least of which being uh, tax cuts. The second thing you can notice that jumps out at you from this is the downstate upstate. And you can see that the growth is going to be downstate, continue to be downstate, and uh, not so good in, in upstate. The good news is, is that in upstate, you see the long list, uh, Albany is likely to be the strongest. And Albany is likely to be the strongest because we're seeing real growth in all sorts of places, particularly Rensselaer County, which is really uh, posting some really nice gains. So there's kind of good news and bad news. The, the, the bad news is downstate continues to do well, upstate continues to do less well, but the good news, of course, is that Albany, for a variety of reasons, 
uh, continues to be the top in upstate New York. Um, let me uh, just take one second to say something about the volatility that hit the market recently. And, and this I want to just sort of, when you, everybody in this room that watched it, uh, down, two thousand, down 1,000 points, down 1,000 points, down 12.2%, up 10.4%. The volatility in the stock market increased 250%. That was a really shaking experience. That has to shake the confidence of just about every investor, even if we're not at the end of the cycle. I, I want to point something out, which is, I think, important. And that is this, is that this shows you the consensus forecast for uh, interest rates, a uh, yield on a 10-year treasury at the beginning of December, and then also the most recent uh, consensus forecast. And the consensus forecast has indeed gone up. The expectation is that interest rates will be a little bit higher than everybody thought might be the case at the beginning of uh, December. But it's also the case that, um, that the forecast for earnings also went higher. So you had bad news, the forecast for interest rates went up a little bit. The forecast for earnings, the good news, went up also. Um, the point being, there was enormous volatility. And even though there was enormous volatility, there was not much change in the most important fundamentals that drive the stock market. There was not much change, some, but not much, in the forecast for interest rates as well as the forecast for earnings. The point being is that the volatility that you see in the market, I can explain, but I'm not going to try to explain it right now, but is traceable largely to uh, trading in derivative products uh, by um, geniuses on Wall Street. And I don't like to say that. It sounds very disparaging. But um, I, I really would like to see the SEC and others uh, get really tough on, uh, on the trading and derivatives. It's a game that really can, uh, really uh, is very, very troubling to people that are serious investors such as ourselves and can be very uh, demoralizing and intimidating uh, to small investors and does not paint an accurate figure of what's going on. It's not related to what's really going on in the underlying economy and something needs to be done about it. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically it. Let me just finish with this. Yes, we've got tax cuts. And, and yes, the tax cuts are positively affecting earnings. And yes, the tax cuts are positively affecting the stock market or the stock market will benefit from the cut reduction in taxes. But it's also the case, as you know, that uh, deficits, the public debt is going to get higher and higher and higher. It's going to not only get higher, bigger numbers, but it's also become bigger as a percentage of gross domestic product. These numbers, I don't have, the, I don't have it down there other than from the Congressional Budget Office. Um, they're going to get up pretty close, and they do uh, get above 90%. Um, here's the comments, and I'll just leave this up there for you to read. Here's the comments based on some serious studies done, done by Ro Reinhardt and Rogoff of Harvard, which talk about the levels to which um, an economy uh, can uh, manage, successfully manage, uh, high debt levels as a percentage of gross domestic product. And the conclusion they have reached, based on a study of two centuries of work, and I think it's reasonably good work, um, is that once we get to 90%, some real problems start to happen for the economy. And that's what I think is really the problem. Um, right now, things are uh, fine. The economy will expand through 2018, 2019. That's good news. Um, uh, but there's going to come a time uh, when uh, I believe that the Congress is going to say, um, this is not good news that the debt has become so high as a percentage of gross domestic product. And then not only will we have the Federal Reserve leaning towards restraint, raising interest rates, but there's a likelihood, I think, a guess, but a likelihood that the Congress will start to take steps to try to reduce or cut back on the size of the deficits and therefore debt. Now, the reason I say that is this, is that because that could be very problematic. And that's really, really tough. Um, in 1937, 38, Roosevelt got uh, cold feet because the deficit was rising. And so he uh, leaned towards fiscal restraint, raised taxes. As a result, uh, the economy went into a tailspin and a recession, and the stock market declined 45%. So how you guys deal with this is going to be extremely important, John, uh, because it carries with it all sorts of risks. And in my judgment, 
those risks start to get fairly significant when we get into the latter half of 2019 and into 2020. Uh, the, the, the only last thing I had that I want to put up there, and I don't know why I'm putting it up there, but I am putting it up there, is this is housing, because people always ask about housing. But housing to me, um, if you look at the growth rates down below, particularly the growth rates of new home sales, existing home sales and housing starts, they start to come down in 2019. Take a look at those growth rates. And what's interesting is, invariably, as history goes, uh, housing tends to lead the end of a cycle. And there's some suggestions in these numbers that we're gonna start to see that start to come down. Part, the bottom line is, look, um, th this, this, you know this has been a long cycle. I've already talked to you about this being a long cycle. You've got to be on edge, not just because it's a long cycle, but because of the volatility we've seen in the markets, which is scary. And you've got to be asking yourselves, what do I do about my current portfolio and what do I do about my business? And the answer to those questions, I believe, is in these numbers, and that is we have further to go in the current cycle. The economy will, the stock market will go up, the economy will continue to expand, interest rates will go up in 2018 for sure, and as we get into 2019, you've got to pay very close attention to all of the kind of tea leaves, shall we say, that tell you we're reaching the end of the cycle. So good news for now, but folks, stay tuned. This is late, we've moved along. I really appreciate you all coming. I appreciate you not falling asleep. <laughs> I appreciate your attention, and I'd be happy to have any, answer any questions if you have any, or if you wanna come up, Mike. Thank you.